Yo, it's your boy Dink the Sink. Let's talk about China. Now, it's no secret that China's been expanding its power abroad. So I'm going to explain what's hip hop happening and how we got to this point. First of all, let's start with the geopolitical landscape we live in today. My boy Trumpulon Prime just pulled off the Briggs prank of 2016, and his policies are mostly isolationist. It's clear that he's anti-globalization, and just like the populist movement that's sweeping Europe, Trump is telling the rest of the world that they can suck on his golden balls. And with the US and Europe leaving international affairs, there isn't going to be a strong country to be a world police. I mean, who's going to take over? <laughs> the UN? <laughs> So in a vacuum, some pointing must take the spot. An opportunity to seize power caused politicians to get an appetite, and China's hungrier than Ethiopian kid on Weight Watchers. Instead of slowly pushing the US out of world affairs, the US is leaving willingly, allowing China to seize power. But how did China even get to this point where it could actually challenge US authority? Well, it was primarily its transition from a retarded economic system to one that actually works. Uh, we can thank people such as Deng Xiaoping and Li Shanxi for doing that. A uh, little story time, because it's actually pretty funny. Mao Zedong really didn't like Deng Xiaoping, even though Deng actually knew what he was doing with the economy. Uh, Mao was like that kid on the playground that just convinced all the other kids that they should eat rocks. And, and Deng was that kid that came up to them and told them like, Please stop. Because of this, Mao purged Deng twice. But Deng, he didn't care, okay? He came back both times, waited until Mao died, outmaneuvered Mao's designated successor, and then dragged Chen out of the shithole it was decades ago, okay? He was an absolute madman. It was like the Gorbachev of China if Gorbachev was able to hang on to power. So now China's ruler is Xi Jinping, and Xi's not fucking around, okay? He understands China's power, and he wants to use it. He's the old school class of politicians who see the world as a zero-sum game. If my enemies gain, I lose. And he's making sure that China doesn't. Lose. <laughs> okay. So how is he and his party going about this? Well, first, we've got the South China Sea being claimed by China. China believes that certain islands and parts of the ocean are Chinese. Now, this is a problem because the other countries also are a part of the ocean. I mean, China, come on. You, you can't just say the whole ocean is yours just because you said so. You, you, you can't just take it. R right? Right? The U.S. was able to make sure that the sea was open to international trade, but you can even see this in the news now. If the U.S. leaves the South China Sea, there isn't going to be anyone to check China's power. China is going to be able to negotiate favorable trade deals that allow the islands to pass into Chinese territory, not to mention what might happen to Taiwan. These islands passing into China's territory allow for many things, but I'm going to focus on two. First, military bases, which China is already doing. It's threatened by U.S. power abroad, and by shitting out bases everywhere, it'll be able to expand territory as well as get stronger. Because if you're like a Malaysian fisherman, and you've been fishing in one spot for years, and one day, you know, China says, stop, don't fish there, that's ours now. <laughs> you're like, what the fuck, you know, I'm still going to fish there. But one day, you're going to fish in that spot, and you see a Type 52 sitting there. What are you going to do then? You're not going to yell out, you know, like, let's go, and try to fucking ram it. This leads me to my next point. Fishing. The seas around China are severely overfished. Like, there's almost nothing there. So China needs to get more fishing space to feed their huge population. China's been doing both of these things right now. They've been creating military bases and warding off foreign fishermen, allowing their own fishermen to work those waters. The Filipino government went a dispute concerning this in 2016. International court basically told China that they don't have any claims to that territory and need to leave. But China pulled in 1933 Japan and responded with a fuck off. The US and the Philippines have been staunch allies for the past several years, as the US was the big brother that stopped China from getting too aggro and pushing mid lane, but that might change. Durete, the current gang leader turned god king of the Philippines, has been saying that the Philippines have been under US influence for too long, and that he's gonna get help from China. Now, is he actually gonna do that? I don't think so. But it's kind of a sign of changing times, when a historically staunch US ally is now threatening that they're gonna join the Chinese sphere of influence, it signals the increase of Chinese soft power. So what else is China doing to cement power? African investment. China is dumping money into Africa, building up its infrastructure and giving jobs to Africans. Some people see this as neo-colonialism, but not Africa. A majority of them think China's influence is beneficial. But whatever it is, you can be sure that it's taking power away from the IMF and other Western-led organizations. With China building up African countries, they're going to be more reliant on Chinese goods and Chinese money, even building up more Chinese soft power. Not on a small scale either. China is Africa's biggest trading partner. 
surpassing the U.S. And since we're talking about trade, let's talk about the Chinese economy. After Deng's reforms in the 1980s, Chinese manufacturing swiftly rose, and they've been riding that train for like 30 years now. But it's not going to last for long. The Chinese economy is slowing down. Anyone who can't see that is kind of a dumbass. Just look at these GDP numbers. You can clearly see the growth rate slowing. And the Chinese know it. An economic slowdown is going to allow countries such as India and Brazil to catch up and do what China did to the U.S. And what the U.S. did to Great Britain after World War II. And so on. Once it becomes a mature economy, it'll be susceptible to recessions. And it's going to happen. For example, the Chinese housing bubble is going to burst. It's inevitable. It's like a paraplegic standing in front of a steamroller. But it's got other ways of maintaining its superiority now. First, by allowing Africa to become dependent on Chinese investment, China's got a permanent trading partner and ally. It's very smart what they did, you know, and it helps the Africans too, since the West wasn't going to do shit. There's also the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, which is China's way of taking over the role of the IMF and the World Bank. This bank will allow China to have a bigger hand in developing and supporting Asian nations, as well as the One Belt, One Road policy, which is a huge trade deal that spans like 100 countries, all the way from Australia to England. It's the president's idea of reviving the Silk Road and allowing Chinese goods to travel all the way to Europe. And, you know, guess who's funding it? The AIIB. It's a big deal, you know, read its Wikipedia page if you want to know more. Obama tried to do something about this with the TPP, but we all know how that ended. I'm not saying I support the TPP, I'm just saying it was made to counter China's influence. This is also kind of obvious, as it included a lot of countries except China. The TPP failed, and now the Chinese have no one to challenge them in terms of trade. You might be saying to yourself, like, China's bad and we have to stop them. And I'm not going to dispute that, you know, censorship of Hong Kong, censorship of the internet, ruthless attitude towards international affairs, persecution of minority groups, unrestricted pollution, re-education of political enemies. They all might lead up to that idea, but you also have to look at it from China's point of view. Number one, what is the U.S. doing in the South China Sea anyway? Why does it even have military bases there? Why? It's like if Canada started making forts in Somalia. Why are you there? China sees U.S. influence as a threat to its power. Number two, China's influence is beneficial. The Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank invests in infrastructure projects such as roads and bridges. The One Belt, One Road policy allows greater freedom of trade and lower cost of goods. And their African investments do help African countries. So why does China have to stop doing this? They only have to stop because the U.S. told them to? <laughs> Sean Spicer the alternative facts guy, has said that the US is going to fight China on their expansion, that they're going to try to curtail the creation of Chinese islands. But that's a big disconnect between what Trump says he's going to do and what he actually does. Withdrawing from the TPP is allowing China to expand. Withdrawing from international affairs and not trying to protect other countries is going to allow China to expand. Trump just needs to figure out what stance he's going to choose. Right now he's keeping both his options open, whether he wants to be hard or soft on China. If he chooses to be soft on China, he can expect that China is going to keep continuing what they're doing and try to cement power. If he's going to go hard, then he can expect a lot of diplomatic backlash, as well as the possibility of a trade war, which no one wins at that point. But, I don't know. I mean, it's possible that the God King's playing 5D chess right now, and he knows every single move that's going on. But we'll just have to wait and see.